same leptons, and the ones which do interact strongly are called by an equally horrible name, baryons. So I start out by discussing the ones which are, do not interact strongly and which are called leptons. And I start to tell you what they are. Well, the first one in the list is, if we put the name of the particle here, and uh, here we can put the mass of the particle in these nutty units, ME, MEVs. And then, uh, well, I'll put down an electric coupling, which we'll call charge. The strength of the coupling to, elect to the photon. This is the coupling to the photon, in, in, in another word. But the unit I'm going to use is one for the positron. So the first one is an electron. And its mass in MeV is 511. And its charge to the photon is minus one, by definition. It's the scale in which I want to measure. And I use minus because of Benjamin Franklin, who chose to call the electron minus. OK, so we're stuck with that since 1776. <laughs> now, and lots of other things we're stuck with since 1776, <laughs> which some of them are not so concerned as I am. At any rate, I now may continue this list of these particles. We have discovered another particle, which is called the muon, which has a mass of 105.6. It's 206 point, bop, 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 bop. We know it very much more accurately than I'm writing it, times that of an electron, and its charge is minus 1. It does not have a strong interaction. And your first guess would be that it propagates like an electron, except that in this place where I put the mass, I'm sorry, after I renormalize the mass, this is a renormalized mass, it should just be a different number. And that that's all the muon should be. And that's all the muon is. There's nothing different about a muon and an electron that we can find except its mass. It's different. It has a different mass. It's just as if God wanted to try out a different number for the mass. And, uh, for example, the magnetic moment of a, of a muon has been measured and is 0016529. Well, first, we calculate it theoretically because it's, if there was not, had no strong interaction, no magic, it's just electrodes, quantum, we use quantum electrodynamics, same kind of diagram, same game, and get this number, zero, plus or minus one. Well, let me get it just right. It's three, I think, plus or minus one. You don't really care, but the fun of it is to see how nice it works. This is only to three plus or minus one. That's the calculated value. And the experimental value is blah, 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 blah. Nine O, blah is being exactly the same. Plus or minus three. I don't want to write the one over one. But this isn't as quite as accurately calculated or measured as the electron. But within the calculations and measurements, they agree. And this turns out to test the idea that there's nothing wrong at short distances more accurately than the other. Because due to the very much higher mass, that simply means that the amplitudes are changing much more rapidly, by 200 times more rapidly. And therefore, if anything is wrong with the electrodynamics over a short distance, this is 200 times more sensitive to see that there's something wrong. Nothing seems to be wrong. So our space, that's how we know from this, in fact, that the space is down, as accurate down to distances or frequencies, rates corresponding to 20,000 in these scales. The electrodynamics would be right up to 20,000, as we now know, uh, before there's a serious error. Well, that's kind of interesting, and that produces the problem. Well, where does it come from? You see, now, if you don't like trying to figure out where that mass comes from, your problem is, what, what is the ratio? Why is, this too, is there another answer, so to speak, to some problem? It's as though you had a quadratic equation that's got in a book, you know, that has two solutions. Here it is with two solutions, and somehow or other, there's one answer and another answer, but we don't know what the equation is that has those two answers. 
I know there's some of you clever kids in algebra can cook up an equation that has those two answers. <laughs> but if you didn't know the answer, you wouldn't know how to write that equation. Now, very recently, within the last year or year or two, I think, it sort of gradually became apparent, though it's not exactly a year or two. First clues were a little older. We discovered there's another one. Mass is this time 1860 approximately. Times in these units, which is something like 3,640 times as heavy as an electron. It's twice as heavy as a proton. Its charge is minus one. And as far as we know, and we don't know much. First, we know it doesn't interact strongly with nuclear, with, doesn't interact strongly. Second, it behaves for the few experiments that it does behave. Everything can be understood so far by supposing it's another example of an object which obeys quantum electrodynamics perfectly like an electron with no uh, error. But uh, there is no, I can't write anything down. We haven't measured any magnetic moments or anything of any accuracy. It's just the beginning of understanding it. All right? Now, uh, obviously, there's another one down here, huh? What you've got to do is guess the rule to make these. This uh, lecture is to try to tell you really what we don't understand about nature. We don't understand that at all. That makes it very interesting to be a theoretical physicist because you have these wonderful puzzles. Why does she repeat herself at that 206 times and then a 306-40 times or whatever it is? So, of course, you want me to write down the next one, but I have no more knowledge. At the present time, machines are being built to try to do experiments at higher energy. These are very high energy. And uh, they are designed to, to look for the another one, if there's another one down here, unless that's too far along. If it comes out that that one should be at 10,000, we're not going to find it. But if it's at 4,000, we might find it. Okay? All right, that's all. That's all I can say about those particles. But I'll say some more. The muon is, in fact, unstable. Otherwise, if it were stable, you would wonder why it isn't in atoms. Why you can't have a proton with a muon going around it? You can. There is such a thing as called a mu-mesic atom, in which the mu takes the place of an electron. And its energy levels are all computable and everything by the regular way they do for electrons. The numbers are much bigger. It's an e instead of emitting light, this atom emits x-rays. But those are just numbers. It's a shorter, higher frequency. But the thing that's interesting is a muon, oh, by the way, like the electron has an antiparticle, which is a positron with charge one. That's true of all these particles. Everybody going forward can go backwards in time. Like the electron, when it turns around, becomes a positron. The muon is negative. There's an anti-muon, which is positive, and presumably, yes, definitely, an anti-tau, which is positive. Anyway, the muon, which is written as mu minus, by make it look nice, disintegrates. And it emits an electron. Uh, the muon sits here, and in about two minutes of a second, an electron comes shooting out, sometimes fast, sometimes slow. But the conservation of energy doesn't la allow that. What really turns out, what careful experiments have shown, that there are two additional particles coming out, one of which is called an anti-neutrino E, and the other one a neutrino mu. So I have to tell you about neutrinos now. So I put those in the same list. We have a thing called a neutrino, or rather more precisely, the electron neutrino, neutrino E, which I write a new E, because I'm getting tired of writing the word. That's just a symbol, neutrino E. It has a mass, as nearly as we can tell, a mass at rest of zero. It always seems to go along at the speed of light. Its charge is zero. So it doesn't interact with photons, and it doesn't interact with nuclei. It doesn't, if it never interacted with anything, <laughs> we would never find it. But we did find it, so we have to learn something. Now it turns out there's another kind of a neutrino. There's another neutrino, the neutrino mu. You're not going to get tired of this because you're going to keep piling these things on until you're drugged. There's so many so particles. I can't help it. I'm trying to tell you how horribly complex, apparently, the world really looks. And if I would give you the impression that since we solved 99% of the phenomena with electrons and photons, that the other 1% of the phenomena will take only 1% as many additional particles. It turns out to explain those. 
take 10 times or 20 times as number of particles. Okay, this one also has a mass zero, although, of course, experiment can only measure to a certain accuracy, and I'm not sure. It might be as big as an electron or two. And charge zero. The tau, huh? What about it? Add another one, huh? Neutrino for the tau. Well, I put it in parentheses, things what everybody thinks are there but have not had the slightest experimental information. They don't know whether there's one here. And we certainly don't know whether the mass is zero. But we surely know it's neutral because we defined it. <laughs> anyway, what's in parentheses are good guesses. Okay? Now, about these neutrinos. This process is understood this way, by saying a muon comes along here, just the present view of it. Well, the first way, and, and it turns into a neutrino, the nu mu type, okay? This is time going this way in space. And then, I think maybe this is in the way. <laughs> You're clever. All right, now it's your way. Okay. And uh, at the same time, it's produced an electron. Use the square chalk. I've got the round chalk. And an anti-neutrino. Like, let's put the arrows forward for the particles and backward for the antiparticle. So the anti-neutrino would be coming in this way. Okay? And the four of them come to a junction. And the theory is present theory, which works nicely in predicting the, re the pr rate, the pr properties of this reaction. He said, this is done by a wiggly thing like a photon, eh? You would say, hey, it's like a photon. You put a photon in here and everything is all right. Except a photon can't change the charge of a particle. It, it, if a pho the junction that photons satisfy go between mu and mu, not between mu and neutrino. So this has got to be a new particle. And furthermore, the, the fact that this goes as slowly as it does means that this particle is either coupled very, very weakly, and the coupling is extremely low, or that it's coupled with some more or less reasonable strength, but the mass of this is not zero like the photon. It turns out that the present theory, the one that works very well, made by Salam and uh, Weinberg, is that this object, which goes back and forth here, which is the analog of, a pro of the photon, uh, has a very high mass. And so we start another list of particles. Let's see, I got all of them here. These are all the leptons. And the list goes on. We don't know where it goes, OK? Now I'm going to make another list. Uh, I guess the best place to make the other list is uh, here. which are called uh, bosons, or if you would like better, would be the interacting particles. They are the first one. How do I do it? I give the name, the rest mass, and uh, that's all I'm going to talk about here. The name is the first one is the photon. Ah, yes, the photon. Its rest mass is zero. That means the mass that you put into the d function. Now, this time, we just have to put a different mass in for the d function, so the other particle is called a W. It's a horrible. We haven't got a good name for that. A W boson or something. Intermediate, or W intermediate boson. Horrible name. Anyway, we ought to get a nice name for this one, which we haven't got. Maybe we should call it a